Hey, good morning, y'all. Again, Norman, like Norman said, my name is Ed Griffin Hagen. I'm one of the pastors on our staff at Church on the Trail. I'm thankful and grateful that y'all are here this morning. There's lots of places that you could be, um, but the Lord, I think, has us together for a reason this morning. And it may be that you're watching online, and this may be Wednesday or Thursday next week. But you're here and, and, and listening and, and, and uh, locking arms with other believers for a reason. And I want to, I uh, Miriam just went through a few announcements. I want to give you a couple of quick things as well. Two or three things. One is Susan and I are leading a trip to Israel next April. And if you are interested in that, there's a little brochure out there at the welcome desk, at the welcome center. Um, it's April 19th next year, and uh, we're having a meeting on September the 11th, right after church. For anybody that's interested, we're just going to kind of walk through what that's going to look like next spring. Number one. Number two, um, a lot of you know that we have a, a homeless ministry here at Church on the Trail. This little brochure is out there as well. And... This ministry, we have always tried to be super kingdom-minded here. Not our church or this church or that church, but, but it's the kingdom. It's not little kingdoms, it's the kingdom. And so this homeless ministry was a way to, to tie together a lot of different churches. And in the last six months uh, of this year, we've had 23 churches that have provided volunteers that have jumped into that ministry. And the, Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and, and it is because it's about the kingdom. And, and it may be, you know, serving 150 meals every Monday night or providing furniture for somebody that gets off the streets or clothes or bug spray or all these different things that, that happen in that ministry every Monday night. We do have a, a real need because we have, in the last six months, have gotten, or the Lord let us play some small role in getting about 60 folks off the street and into more permanent housing, and so we have provided the furniture, beds, kitchen tables, whatever, for literally 59, I think is the number, of, of apartments or little rental houses, and we desperately need help with trucks and men to help move. Uh, it's almost every day, and so if you have any interest, feel called, feel led to help with that, please see me maybe after church. Number two. Number three is this. After church today, after our worship service, we, we're providing lunch for everybody. It's going to be next door, no cost, um, but we just want to get together, and I know nobody knows about that until just this second, but, uh, but we do have lunch next door right after church, and so we hope you'll stay and eat and just have some together time, all of us together. That was number three. Number four is this. Um, the, the order of the, the next 45 minutes or so is going to be a little bit different. You know, we're going to have a message, and then we're going to have a, a last song, but then we're going to have about a five-minute little, some stuff that's going on in the life of the church that I want to talk about. Uh, so, so at the end of the last song, I don't want you to leave yet. Give us five or six more minutes, uh, and, then, and then we'll all go next door. And eat. Does that sound okay? That was like a whole other bucket of announcements for three minutes and 36 seconds. So... We, y'all, we've been walking through for, for a while. We've been walking through the book of Acts several, several months now. And a couple of weeks ago, we finished a series that we called A Tale of Ten Cities, where we spent some time looking at, at uh, the Apostle Paul, at Paul's first missionary journey, and that was from A.D. 46 to 48 or 49. It's Acts chapters 13 and 14. And then that, uh, that culminated in this letter that was sent from the Jerusalem Council, and Norman talked last week about, uh, about the Jerusalem Council a little bit. That was around A.D. 50, and that letter that they sent to the church in Antioch in Syria from the guys in Jerusalem, it declared kind of once and for all that Gentiles, particularly men, did not need to get circumcised, circumcised to be saved, and Gentiles did not have to follow and be a slave to the law of Moses to be saved. Norman talked about that. Y'all give Norman a hand. It was an awesome message last week, was it not? He did make one mistake, though, and that mistake was this. Contrary to what he, t if you were here last week, contrary to what 
he told you you actually cannot be a football player and not be a bulldog. So that, that, that was just one little mistake that he made. No, but, but this way I hear an amen. Y'all, this week, though, we're starting a new series, and this series is called The Road Less Traveled, and we're going to walk through uh, Paul's second missionary journey, see what timeless truths God has for us over the next several weeks, um, what, what, what truths that we can pull out of Scripture. We're going to be at the end of Acts uh, chapter 15, and that's late in A.D. 50, and it, we're gonna, it's going to run, we're going to land in several weeks down at the, in the latter part of uh, Acts chapter 18, and that's two or three years later, uh, A.D. 52 or 53. So when we were last here a couple of weeks ago talking about Acts, Paul, Barnabas, Judas, and not the Judas you're thinking about, another Judas, but Paul, Barnabas, Judas, and Silas had just delivered this letter from, from the Jerusalem Council in Jerusalem to the believers in Antioch in Syria. And, and I told you what that letter declared. Well, the believers there in Antioch, they rejoiced. The Bible tells us they rejoiced. The Bible tells us that they were encouraged. And then in Acts uh, 15 and verse 35, it tells us that Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And it's interesting uh, to see here that Luke, and Luke is the author, the human author of the, of, of the gospel of Luke and then of, of Acts. And he tells us, it's interesting, he tells us that they were teaching and they were preaching and so were many other folks. Well, that's interesting because they had poured into that church and they were raising up leaders. Y'all, that's what, that's what happens. Leaders get raised up and sent out and, and, and the, the word of the Lord spreads and, and people get led to Christ. And so uh, Paul and, and Barnabas had poured into the folks there and many others were preaching the word of the Lord as well. And it's interesting to me because it tells me that that, that opened up an opportunity for Paul to feel good about, about leaving again. And, he, and he, so he goes out and, and he's launching, starting another sort of mission trip. Today, because this is, this is what can happen, and we're going to see this at the end of, uh, starting in verse 36 of chapter 15, today we're going to talk about conflict. We're going to talk about disagreements. We're going to talk about disputes. Y'all, people have disagreements. All people have disagreements. I, I, I don't care who they are. People that, uh, that are not believers have conflict, have disagreements. And here's a shocker for you. Christians don't always get along just perfectly, right? During an especially trying and especially sort of difficult season of church planning, Louis Giglio, who is the, the pastor, uh, how many of y'all heard of Louis Giglio? He's a pastor at Passion City in Atlanta, and he, he's in this season of life where he's planting churches, and it was tough, and, and, and he was filled with the, the raw emotions that sometimes run alongside of the messiness of ministry. Y'all know ministry can be messy. And so it, it seems pretty clear for, for, for uh, Giglio that there was a betrayal by somebody in, the, in his inner circle of leadership. And he furiously starts writing this text message to a very dear friend of his. And he expected, what he expected to get back from his buddy was empathy. And maybe even some vindication for his anger. And Giglio writes about this in one of his books. I want to read a quote from one of his books. He had just typed this email, so this text message, sent it out. He said, I pressed send and I waited. Literally, I just stared at the screen looking for my support to arrive. He said, I wanted a reply that resounded with a hearty, hey, Louie, I got your back. I knew you were right all along. I wanted a shoulder to cry on, he says. He said, I want a, wanted a celebra celebratory high five or a fist bump and not the emoji kind. He said, I, I needed actual words in return and lots of them. And another minute passed, and another minute passed, and, and another, and I waited, and I waited. And then when it arrived, he said a, a one-sentence reply, nine words that Giglio said uh, would, 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 would change his life. But as he looked at it, he, he kind of thought, you got to be kidding. But he leaned in, and he focused on these nine words. And the message said, don't give the enemy a seat at your table. That was the text message he got. 
Don't give the enemy a seat at your table. And he said, he said, I pushed aside my annoyance and I let the message sink in and quickly I saw that my friend had nailed it. He goes on, he says, I had allowed my adversary, the devil, to influence the conversation in my mind. You ever let the adversary influence your mind? You know, believers are not immune from that, right? We can be deceived. Giglio went on, he said, my struggle wasn't about fighting with people. People were involved, but the battle I was facing was against principalities and powers of darkness. He said, my heavenly father wasn't, this is such a truism. He said, my heavenly father was not making me afraid or paranoid. My shepherd wasn't putting thoughts of despair in my mind. The harmful thoughts were coming from someone else. The enemy had taken a seat at my table, and I was allowing myself to listen to a killer. Y'all, don't listen to a killer. Don't. He said, my place at the table didn't mean that my enemies would be removed from the equation. In fact, the table was set right in the middle of my, enemy, my enemies. That captivated my imagination and held my attention. I didn't need to vindicate myself. I didn't need to clear my name. I didn't need to control this equation or work overtime to improve it. He said, my task was to concentrate on the good shepherd. To co We've sung two songs lifting the mighty name of Jesus. Our task is to concentrate on him. And, and Giglio said, I need to concentrate on the good shepherd because the good shepherd owns the table. The good shepherd doesn't have a seat at the table. The good shepherd owns the table. So y'all conflict, disagreement, it, 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 it's coming. And so it's not so much about conflict avoidance as it is about handling it appropriately when it happens. Warren Robinson Austin, who was a politician and a diplomat in the 19, late 30s, 40s, and 50s, he, was, he served both in the U.S. Senate and in the United Nations as an as a ambassador for the United States. And during a debate, Austin was asked this in the early 50s. He was asked how he would approach the conflict in the Middle East between the Jews and the Arabs. How are you going to handle this conflict between the Jews and the Arabs? And Austin's advice was simple. He said, sit them down and have them settle their conflict like good Christians do. Y'all, good Christians, there's a Christian way to handle conflict. I don't care if you're Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist. The biblical way to handle conflict is the right way to handle conflict. So look at verse 36. That's where we're going to start this morning. The Bible says, And after some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord. And he's talking about going back to every city they, they, they were at in this first missionary journey. He says, And let us see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He was, or they were commended, they were commissioned again by the church in Antioch. Paul and Silas were commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So there was conflict. The world is full of it. And most of the time it is selfish, it is prideful, and it is evil. But there is such a thing as honest conflict. A honest holding of different opinions. And this short little passage, these five verses or so, kicked off Paul's second huge missionary journey. And it is a great study in conflict. We're going to see three or four things here. The first thing we're going to see is the cause. If you don't have a worship guide, raise your hand. I want to get you one, but we've got a few little fill in the blanks. The first thing we see is the cause of the conflict. Verses 36 through 38. You know, honest conflict springs up from genuine concern, authentic concern, real concern. And the concern is not personal. It's not selfish. It's not self-serving. Honest conflict doesn't exist because somebody is exerting his own authority or trying to get his own way or resisting change or, 
or maintaining some tradition for the sake of tradition. Honest conflict is not rooted in jealousy. And you can see this between Paul and Barnabas. Paul was the one who suggested that they go back to the churches that they saw on their first trip, and, and Barnabas agreed to that. And Barnabas was just as determined to go back as Paul was. They both had genuine concern for the mission. Genuine concern for the mission. They were both determined to visit all the brothers in every city where they had proclaimed the word of the Lord, verse 36 tells us. And their concern was legit. Their concern was real. My point is that each one of them was as concerned as the other one was. And their concern was genuine. And their concern was authentic. And their concern was, was real. And then honest conflict springs up from a genuine difference, a real difference, a, a difference that was, was focused on how to best carry out the Lord's mission. The conflict was focused on how to best carry out the Lord's mission. Y'all, we need to, we, it's critical for us to see that and to understand that because the difference was not over the mission. The difference can't be over the mission. Every single believer, me and you, we got to be committed to the Lord's mission. It's one of the reasons why we're, we're so focused on the name of Jesus being proclaimed in, in the kingdom and not in this church or that. Well, we are focused on it being proclaimed in this church, but not focused on building up this church. The kingdom shouldn't be that way. With the kingdom, we should be working together, locking arms with people across denominations, people that want to be focused on Christ and on the gospel and leading people to the foot of the cross, leading them into a, a saving relationship with the Lord. And that crosses a ton of different churches. Listen, if, if, if they were not focused on the mission, both of them, then the, con then the conflict, if we're not focused on the mission, then the conflict is not an honest conflict. It's false and it's selfish, and it is rooted in pride. It's rooted in maybe you've got to be right or something. I don't know. The difference was over method. It was just over method. It's really easy to see that in what happens with Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas honestly believed that the best way to accomplish the Lord's mission, the task at hand, was to bring John Mark along. Barnabas never would have insisted on bringing John Mark along unless he knew that he knew that he knew that John Mark had, had recommitted his life to the mission. Because if you remember back right before that first journey, John Mark left him. And Barnabas loved Paul dearly. He never, ever would have opposed Paul unless he was convinced that, that, he was, that it was the right call to make to bring John Mark along. And the truth is that, that, that Paul genuinely had a different opinion than Barnabas did on the whole thing with John Mark. He believed, and he did. He believed that John Mark was a quitter, that John Mark was a deserter, and that John Mark would be a poor example for the young churches who needed to be strengthened. He, he Honestly, that's what he thought. The point that I want you to see, really, though, is that this conflict between Paul and Barnabas, it was honest. From the Scripture, both guys were, were as determined as they could be to carry out God's mission. The only question was how best to do it. Specifically, who was really needed to get the job done most effectively, John Mark or Silas? And y'all, as, as long as human beings are on the planet, there's going to be disagreements and there's going to be conflict. Always has been, always will be. Now, tragically, it is usually selfish. It's usually prideful and it's usually self-centered. Me and you as, as Christ followers, we have got to constantly search our hearts and make sure that our differences with others are pure and that they are completely unselfish. If we stay focused on Christ and on his kingdom, it's a whole lot easier to do that. We've got to bathe it in prayer. We've got to trust in the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We've got to move on believing that God has got it under control. It's got to all be about His will, not our will. We've got to be searching 
for his will. We got to be praying for his will. We got to be trusting in his will. And we got to be lining up our actions with his will, not trying to bend his will to justify our actions. Does that make sense? It's about his will. It's not about Ed's will, right? It's not about anybody's, it's about the Lord's will. David wrote this, King David, in, in Psalm 143 and verse 10. He said, teach me to do your will. You can almost see him in the Judean wilderness, and he's looking up at the sky, and he's looking at the, the guy, the God that hung the stars and the moon. And, and I've talked about this before, but there's no ambient light, and there's, there's almost more light in the stars than there is black in the, in the sky. And he's looking at the, at, at, at the sky, and the very one who hung all of that, and he's like, he's crying out to the Lord, teach me to do your will. You are God. I'm not God. And it's unbelievable, Lord, that you even care one iota about me. Teach me to do your will. He said, you are my God. He says, let your, 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 your spirit lead me and let me follow your spirit. So first we see that the cause of this conflict between Paul and Barnabas. And then, and then we see the sad result of honest conflict. Because just because the conflict is an honest conflict doesn't mean that there can't be some sad results. Verse 39 says, and there arose a sharp disagreement. So they separated from each other. And Barnabas and John Mark sailed uh, southwest to Cyprus. I want to show you three or four results. There may be more for sure, but I want to I want to look at three. First, it's, again, Scripture says there's a sharp disagreement, and the idea in that word that is used and translated as sharp disagreement, at least in the ESV, is, is a differing of opinion up to the point of suffering physical pain, that they're actually suffering pain. And contrary to the image that is usually painted of conflict, this picture seems to say that both men are suffering pain. Both men, not one of them. Both of them are suffering pain. The difference was a sharp difference, and the guy's hearts are hurting. They're, they're, they're cut to the very core. Both were strongly convinced that they were right before the Lord, and because of that, they pled their case, and they argued big time strongly for, for their respective position. It doesn't mean this sharp disagreement. It doesn't mean that they were ripping each other apart and cussing each other out. The world today tells you if you have a disagreement with somebody that you're supposed to cuss them out, beat them up, and kick them in the head when they're down. And you're supposed to hate them. Y'all, that is not the way Christians handle stuff. We can disagree without hating each other. Can we not? We need to be the ones that display to the world the way to handle a disagreement. Not Washington, because they're going to tell you that you need to hate each other. Each one of them was really strongly thought that they and believed authentically that they were making the, the right call. It's a huge point. It's a huge point. Y'all, we, we should never be nasty to each other. Never. Never. These two men, they loved and they respected each other. It just kind of looks like the disagreement they had, at least they thought, was irreconcilable. It seemed, there seemed to be no solution. You ever had a disagreement where there seemed to not be a solution? That's kind of where they were. Second thing that we see, the little result here, is that that there was a loss of each other. And that little nugget is often forgotten, but, but it shouldn't be. Because if you remember, they loved each other, and they respected each other. When Paul needed help, Barnabas was a spiritual brother. Barnabas stepped up to the plate. Because you remember when Paul goes back to Jerusalem the first time, the, after in, Rome, in, uh, in Acts 9, after Paul gets saved, the risen Christ appears to him, None of those brothers in Jerusalem believed it. They are like, this Paul? He's the one that's picking up boulders and stoning folks and arresting folks. They didn't believe it. Well, Barnabas is the one that came and said, no, 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 guys, he's okay, he's with me. So Barnabas was like a spiritual brother, maybe even a spiritual father to Paul. Acts chapter 11, we see Barnabas nurturing Paul along in the faith and in his ministry. So, so Paul owed a bunch to Barnabas. He would never have allowed 
the conflict to divide them unless he was thoroughly convinced also that he was right. And Barnabas loved Paul so much in, in very much the same way, and so that was true of him as well. Conflict was an honest conflict, but the results were kind of tragic because two brothers in Christ, two buddies, strong in the Lord, so caring for each other, their ministry was kind of splitting up. Well, that begs the question, which one was wrong, which one was right? Don't ask me. We don't really know for certain because Scripture doesn't really tell us, but it does look like that Paul misjudged John Mark. The rest of as history rolls out, it looks like he kind of misjudged John Mark. It also looks like the church in Antioch tragically failed by only commissioning, at least the text tells us, commissioning uh, Paul and Silas and not Barnabas and John Mark. See, later on we see in Scripture, we see John Mark serving alongside Peter. We see John Mark serving alongside Paul. So he must have redeemed himself. Paul spoke affectionately in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 about Barnabas, acknowledging Barnabas' great ministry. You know, i got to believe based on their relationship, Paul and Barnabas, before this happened, they really tried to everything to figure it out and work it out. For you and I, when conflict arises, I didn't say if, I said when conflict arises, we got to make every effort possible to suppress pride, to deny self, to keep Jesus in the front of it all, and to amicably work things out. That's the way Christians handle conflict. Make every effort to, to serve and to live with peace and in peace with our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, about 10 years after this, Paul wrote in Philippians in chapter 1, verse 27. Paul wrote, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. He said, just talk, walk the talk. Just let your, your witness of every day when you're walking through life, let that be worthy of the gospel that you claim to believe. He's pleading with the, 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 the folks in, in Philippi. He says, do that so that whether I come and see you or whether I'm absent, that I'm going to hear that you are standing firm in, in one spirit, one spirit with one mind, striving side by side, striving uh, with your arms locked together for the faith of the gospel. Our arms should be locked together for the sake of Christ, not for the sake of us. One mind, one accord, striving together. He goes on in chapter 2 in uh, verses 3 and 4. He says, do nothing. He said, don't be all selfish. Don't get a big head. Don't, don't wave your arms in the, in the sky so everybody's going to look at you. He says, no, no, no. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. That doesn't mean do a few things. It means do nothing with a big head. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. He says, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but to, to the interests of others. When you and I, as followers of Christ, when we are, become aware that we are wrong, now we've got to know that we're wrong. We've got to own it. We've got to acknowledge it. We've got to correct it as soon as we possibly can. Just think, John Mark was the author of the second book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Mark. Had he not been redeemed, I don't think the Lord would have had him to pen the Gospel of Mark. Barnabas must have been really an incredible friend. He was a huge helper, encourager. That's what the word, what his name means, encourager. He was a huge helper to those who were cast aside as both Paul and John Mark kind of were. How much of John Mark's ministry, how much of Paul's ministry, how much of the gospel according to Mark is tied right back to Barnabas and his faithfulness in making true disciples out of both of those men? What an incredible servant of the Lord that Barnabas really was. So number two is, in fact, 
the sad results of honest conflict. In this case, was the parting of ways of Paul and Barnabas. It leads me to my third point, and that is this. The good, we looked at the sad result, but let's look at the good result of honest conflict. We may even say the good results of honest conflict. Remember verse 39 said there was a disagreement. Barnabas took John Mark, headed to Cyprus, and Paul and Silas departed, and they went through Syria and Cilicia. They went through strengthening the churches. I'm going to call this the Romans 8.28 effect. Romans 8.28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together. Is there a period there? Say no. Is it on the screen behind me? Yeah. It's not a period. All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those who love God, he stirs it up, puts it in a pot, stirs it up, and all things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It's Romans 8.28 effect. Y'all, God 8.28-ifies stuff. That's a hashtag. You need to write that down. 8.28-ify. That is what God does for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. In this case, one of the good results of this honest conflict is that God overruled it. He trumped it. In his sovereignty, sovereignty he redeems it. He redeems it. It's like he buys it back. He, he overrules that conflict between Paul and Barnabas. Both men had honest differences of opinion. Neither one was selfish. Neither one had ulterior or corrupt motives. They both loved God with all their hearts. Both were called according to his purpose. Y'all, just look what God did. Just look what God did, and he still does this kind of stuff. First of all, he redeems things that are busted and broken. It's maybe a marriage that's busted and broken. God redeems it. And a relationship between a father and a son, trust me, God can redeem that. He does. He took a deserter. That's what Paul was sold out that John Mark was a deserter and a quitter. That deserter was reclaimed and was just set on fire for the Lord. He takes a he makes a new disciple and a, and a great minister of the gospel out of Silas. That was birthed here at the end of chapter 15 of Acts. Silas was his name. And then in this big stroke of 828 of fine stuff, two mission teams were sent out. It's going to be one mission team. But God took it and he sent two teams out. Barnabas and John Mark, southwest to Cyprus, the island of Cyprus. Paul and Silas, northeast into Syria and Cilicia. And by the way, Paul and Silas head to the native country of Paul, Cilicia. Barnabas and John Mark go to Cyprus, the native country of Barnabas. That stuff doesn't happen randomly. It doesn't. I want you to see a few other things. Paul clearly was, his heart was hurting. He and Barnabas, his dearest friend and companion in the gospel, they had split up. And the pain for both of them was real and, and, and probably nearly unbearable. But they both continued on, and as hard as it probably was, they pushed ahead because the gospel must advance. The gospel is going to advance. They didn't sit around whining and wondering why the conflict had, had happened. Had they done that, the devil would have got all up in their ear Probably discouragement would have shown up. Probably depression would have shown up. Probably anxiety would have shown up. Jumped all over both of them, but the gospel advances. The gospel always advances. That's what God's doing when he stirs that, that pot up. And as an aside of all of this, Luke, from this point on, Luke, again, the author of Acts, he concentrated on the ministry of Paul. Nothing more is said really in the book of Acts about Barnabas. Now, don't take that to mean, y'all, for a second that Barnabas and John Mark didn't lead a ton of people to Christ. Make no, there's just no way they didn't. That's the mission that they were on. So Barnabas and John Mark go down to Cyprus. I'm sure they led a ton of people 
to Christ. I'm sure they poured in and strengthened the folks in the different churches there. Have no doubt. Paul and Silas travel up into Cilicia. So now Paul is kind of on his home turf. And of course, God is the one who, who routed the trip out. History tells us that it had been about 10 years since Paul had been home. Most of the churches in that region were probably in existence because Paul had, had, had planted them there 10 or 12 years earlier. I believe that God led them there to strengthen and to build up those churches. I also believe that God had Paul there because he knew that being in his home area, among the very first churches that were planted, among the very first bucket of believers, that that would help heal Paul's heart. It would help to strengthen and encourage Paul and allow him to push ahead. Y'all know pastors can get discouraged and need some building up sometimes. We do. We do. And so I think the Lord had Paul in his home area and those people poured into him. He poured into them and they poured into him. That's the way the body of Christ works. Isn't it cool how, how God takes care of his hurting servants when they're faithful to their call and faithful to the ministry? It's an incredible and, and dynamic example of pushing ahead despite being bombarded with setback after setback. Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. He wrote, And let us not grow weary of doing good, don't grow, grow weary. Do my work. Don't grow weary in doing it. Just do it. He says, for in due season we will reap if we don't give up. Perseverance is this massive theme in Paul's writing. Don't give up. Wake up every day and put one foot in front of the other. Even when you don't feel like it, y'all, our feelings will deceive us. And the devil will jump all over our feelings. Put one foot in front of the other, Paul says. And in 1 Corinthians, at the end of 1 Corinthians in chapter 15, verse 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, so he's, this, that, that term just means my dearest brothers and sisters in Christ. He tells them, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, if you're abounding in the work of the Lord, if you're constantly doing the work of the Lord, if you're constantly proclaiming the name of Christ, if you're staying focused on Jesus, 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 he says that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Never, ever, ever will your labor be in vain. So y'all, here's this final sort of upshot. Conflicts, disagreements, they're going to pop up. They, they just are. But let's commit to make sure that they're honest, that they're not self-centered, that they're not prideful, that they're not self-seeking. Let's make sure that we have sought the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that we've prayed through it. Make sure that it's not just mindless bickering about dumb stuff. People bicker about dumb stuff. Like, let's not do that. And if there's a conflict, make it honest. Bathe it in prayer. You know, I heard a story about some monks at a remote monastery deep in the woods, and these monks follow this rigid, this rigid vow of silence. That vow could only be broken one time a year, and that was on Christmas, and only by one monk, and that monk could only speak one sentence. So one time a year, on Christmas, by one monk, and only one sentence. So one Christmas, it was Brother Thomas's turn, and to speak, and he said, I love the delightful mashed potatoes that we have here every year with the Christmas pot roast. And then he sat down, and there was silence for 365 days. The next Christmas, Brother Michael got his turn, and he said, I think the mashed potatoes are lumpy, and I hate them. And once again, silence for 365 days. And the following Christmas, Brother Paul got up and said, I am so fed up with this constant bickering. But, <laughs> so, so y'all, there's going to be conflict. It just needs to be honest. 
Conflict doesn't need to be a dirty word. And disagreement doesn't need to equal hate. Let's know that even though the disagreement is honest, there almost always is going to be some sad results. And then there's this two-word phrase. And this two-word phrase for me is just huge. It's huge. Shows up in the Bible 33 times, best, as I, best that I can count. This two-word phrase, it's just so huge. And the phrase is, but God. But God. Yeah, 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 but God. This, that, this, that, but God. Yeah, they, they said, but God. Did you hear what she said? But God. But God takes what the enemy meant for evil, stirs it up, 828 to find it, and turns it into good. It's what he does. He's been doing that for a long, long time, and he does that. Scripture tells us there's a caveat there. He does that for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. The promise in Romans 8, 28 is not a promise for unbelievers. Don't buy that lie. It's not. It is not. And it doesn't, the Bible doesn't say all things work together for good. No, no, no. For those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It's the 8, 28 effect. Paul and Barnabas had a sharp disagreement, but God. But God took their disagreement and he used it for the kingdom. There is no doubt that the gospel advanced faster and further, no doubt, when God took Barnabas and John Mark and sent them southwest to Cyprus, and Paul and Silas and sent them northeast to Syria and Cilicia. God's ways are perfect. His timing is perfect. His direction is perfect. Because he is perfect. We just got to make sure, y'all, that we are conforming our lives to his will. And we got to make sure that we are all kingdom-minded. Jesus-centric, Jesus-focused, and kingdom-minded. And y'all, when I say that we got to be Jesus-focused, you got to know that if you are not a follower, let last night be the last night that you went to bed lost. Let tonight be the first night that you go to bed found. It's super simple. I got to repent, which is just a churchy way to say turn away from the sin and turn towards the Lord. It's a two-turn thing because it's a 90-degree turn away from sin and it's a 90-degree turn towards the Lord. So it's a 180-degree turn. And I got to do that. And then I got to believe that my sins got to get paid for and that it was paid for on that cross 2,000 years ago right outside of Jerusalem. Blood was spilled all over that cross and that took care of my sin. And he went in that grave dead and he came out of that grave alive. And that, that aliveness allows me to live with him for eternity. That's a simple gospel. I'm a sinner in need of rescue. I got to turn away from that sin, believe that he died on that cross, confess that, believe that he walked out of that grave alive. Y'all, the empty tomb changes everything. Changes everything. When you buy into that, that that really happened in history, changes everything. See, so y'all pray with me. Lord, let today be the day that I turn away from my sin. That I believe that you died on that cross and it took care of my sin. And Lord, that you walked out of the grave alive. And then I cry out, Lord, save me. And he will. He never said no to anybody yet. So Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, y'all, if you need prayer for anything we got a prayer station back there in the back we welcome you um, to step back there we welcome you as we're worshiping uh, with this last song you're invited to the cross if you need to dump something there he's got big broad shoulders and he can handle whatever you can put there
again, I want to I make sure that y'all stay for five or six minutes right after this last song. <laughs>